with the osteoporosis guidelines, the version 2024, there has been a fair bit of changes. Um, we are moving away a lot from just, you know, screening people based on uh, age and bone mineral, mineral density. And they have introduced uh, the fracture risk and the FRAX calculator. And that plays a big role in treating a larger number of people who are uh, suffering from osteoporosis or are, are at high risk of fracture uh, for other reasons. As you're aware, the osteoporosis, the definition is still the same, and that is a T-score on your bone mineral density of less than minus 2.5. Anything between minus 1 and minus 2.5 is considered osteopenia, and anything you know, higher than that is going to be normal bone mineral density. There's also some emphasis on Z score. You know, T score is the definition is is what we use for definition of osteoporosis and osteopenia. But Z score also is used, particularly in younger people, to assess the bone health if there is indication for assessing bone health. Also, if Z score by itself is less than minus two, which basically compares the bone density with same age and sex, that's concerning. That's a reason to investigate the causes for bone fragility in that particular patient. So that score has its own use, and particularly less than minus two is something to worry us. In order to assess bone mineral density, the best test that we have is our DEXA scan, which is basically dual energy X-ray absorptiometry known as DXA or DEXA scan. There are some other modalities, for example, the transmission ultrasound, uh, which can assess the heel bone more than anything else. Uh, they are, they work, they are not completely unreliable, but they're not considered gold standard. So for the purpose of assessing for osteoporosis and fracture risk, we always rely on uh, bone mineral density tested via DEXA scan. So this is the old osteoporosis guidelines that you don't need to worry too much about anymore, but I just put it in here for comparison. So in the old guidelines, we didn't have much emphasis on fracture risk. So even if there was some talk about the fracture risk, it was you know in the bottom of the algorithm and not in the top. And in the new one, there is a lot that we do with the fracture risk, even in some cases, as you would learn in the next slide, before we do the bone mineral density, we rely on fracture risk first, uh, with major fracture risk that we're going to learn about, uh, even before we do the DEXA scan. So the fracture risk is going to help us to uh, exclude the need for DEXA scan in some patients, and also is going to capture some patients who may have close to normal bone density on DEXA scan, but still are at high risk of fracture, and they still require treatment for osteoporosis. This is the fresh one. This page is the summary of all we need to know. The guidelines are prepared for us, Australian GPs. I don't think many of our specialist friends would refer to this one. So this is written purely for us to use and not to rely so much on specialist colleagues. Uh, it's designed like other guidelines, for example, the CKD one that you went through hopefully last week, and it's a fresh one, the 2024 version. They are is designed to empower us as the Australian GPs to do things with confidence and following the protocols step-by-step step without uh, being worried about missing something or doing something wrong. So we are empowered and confident in dealing with major problems in our community. So in this new one, as you can see, we still have the section on the right, which we used to have in the previous one with some changes. Like for example, age over 70 by itself was a reason to order bone density. 
it is not anymore, even though it's one of the non-modifiable risk factors, but it's not a reason by itself to order bone mineral density. So if I can bring up my uh, pen, I can show you with more details. So let's just start by the, the ones that we are more familiar with from the past. So if someone has risk factors for osteoporosis, and remember, this is only to be used for men and women over age of 50. We don't use this one for people under age of 50, over age of 50. If someone has non-modifiable risk factor, for example, age over 70, or a parent with hip fracture, or some lifestyle, uh, lifestyle risk factors, which can be modified, we don't need to go straight ahead with the bone mineral density test. We can quickly, in our rooms, with the use of the, the fracture, which is called FRAX, Fracture Risk Calculator. We can calculate the risk. If the risk is less than 10%, we don't need to refer that person to DEXA scan. We can be comfortable, as long as they didn't have any fracture in the past, we can be confident that this patient does not need DEXA scan, and we can repeat this calculation again a few years down the track. Usually two years is a good interval. If the patient has some other risk factors, like the comorbidities, like early menopause, hypogonadism in men, celiac disease impacting the mineral absorption, rheumatoid arthritis, primary hyperparathyroidism, which again takes the calcium out of the bones, hyperthyroidism, diabetes, chronic liver or kidney disease, myeloma, or organ or bone marrow transplant, or HIV, then we don't need to waste time with the use of FRAX to, ca to calculate the fracture risk. We know that we still need to do bone mineral density anyway. If the bone mineral density, and the same applies to people who are on certain medications, for example, the uh, prednisolone equivalent dose of more than 7.5 milligram a day for longer than four months, anyone with excess thyroid hormones, hormone replacement, men who have prostate cancer and are on androgen deprivation therapy, or women who have breast cancer and are on aromatase inhibitors, any of these two boxes, we still go ahead with BMD uh, measurement first. If the T-score is suggestive of osteoporosis with less than minus 2.5, then we use our usual treatment options that we have in general practice, most commonly bisphosphonates. They are the ones that we like to use first hat off the shelf. They are considered safest in the long run. They've been around for longer than, for example, the nosomap. And we know that they are considered, you know, as long as we exclude the contraindications, they are considered safer and more effective than the other options that we have. Uh, the nosomap still is an, op is an option. Uh, again, a second line option. Yes, it does have the ease of use with a six monthly injection. But we are aware that, you know, this is a treatment that we have to go indefinitely because as soon as you stop or if there is uh, irregularity in giving the injections, if, it, if the patient presents, you know, much longer than six months between the, the treatments, there is a risk of spontaneous vertebral fracture even in multiple vertebrae. So we are not that keen on denosumab as our first line anymore unless there is a reason to choose this medication. And for women, uh, postmenopause women, we have hormone therapy uh, as an option. Again, there are certain indications. We don't choose uh, hormone replacement therapy only for treatment of osteoporosis. We need to have usually more reasons than just a simple osteoporosis. If any of these people went through the bone mineral density assessment, and the result comes back as osteopenia, which is minus 1.5 and minus 2.5, then we still, instead of just calling it osteopenia and based on the previous guidelines, we had to pretty much just put them on uh, 
calcium, making sure they have enough calcium, vitamin D in most cases. Now we still need to calculate the fracture risk again. If the fracture risk is high, a major osteoporotic fracture risk is more than 20%, or a risk of hip fracture is more than 3%, either of those, you, don't need, you only need one of those, then you still need to treat the patient for osteoporosis with the options that we have. So this is a major uh, extra step in assessing patients for osteoporosis and putting people on medications. The other one is the middle one, people who suffered minimal trauma fracture. And minimal trauma fracture generally is a fracture that is caused by a trauma which is equivalent to a fall from the usual height, not from the ladder. If someone is falling from standing height and breaking a bone, that is considered minimal trauma. If the broken bone is hip or vertebrae, that is by itself enough to consider treatment, not to consider, to basically go ahead with treatment. If someone from a minimal trauma fracture has broken a hip or a vertebrae, or a vertebra, I should say, that is enough to go ahead with the similar treatment options. We can still order a DEXA scan, not to confirm the diagnosis or not to decide if we need treatment or not. The decision is already made. But the DEXA scan gives you some baseline. So when patient is on treatment, further down the track, you can see how much the treatment has impacted the bone density. And it does help with the patient adherence to medication as well. But anyone with hip or vertebra fracture will receive treatment um, for osteoporosis. If they had minimal trauma fracture and and broken another bone, for example, a collis fracture, distal radius fracture, for example, or an arm bone, um, you mean humerus, I mean, or pelvic fracture, then we can't go ahead straight to treatment. We still need to order a DEXA scan. If they have osteopenia, they still need to receive treatment. If they don't have osteopenia, then they require investigation of the cause of the fracture because you don't expect a non-osteoporotic bone to break from a minimal trauma. And the new introduction again is the very high risk group, which we did not have in the old guidelines specifically. These are people who, if we identify, they need to be referred to specialists straight away because they would benefit from more than what we usually have to offer, which is bisphosphonates or denosumab or hormone replacement therapy, these people need stronger medications, which can improve the bone um, production of, uh, of the bones, basically osteoblastic effect, and not just anti-resorptive therapy, because the ones that we have as an option in GP land are anti-resorptive, whereas these the medications that we are going to discuss later, for example, uh, romosumab, are the one which are um, used to increase the bone density in a more efficient way. For diagnosis of very high risk, which requires immediate referral, you need a TS score of less than minus three, but also you need at least one more risk factor, the one are listed here. You may not have any, any of the other ones, but you may need to run a fracture assessment, fracture risk calculation using FRAX. And if you find, for example, a major osteoporotic fracture risk of over 30% or a hip fracture risk of over 4.5%, either of these, whichever is higher, then they require urgent referral and we don't waste time by putting them on any of our usual medications. So this is the very summary of new osteoporosis guidelines. Now I'm going to go through and fill in the gaps and elaborate on certain areas which are not completely clear in this one-page summary. This is a picture of the freely available FRAX version, which gives you the calculated risk of fracture over the next 10 years. There are 12 elements in there, as you can see. 
One of them is bone mineral density. As you remember, in some cases, for example, if you only had risk factors but no history of fracture, uh, in certain cases, we didn't have to send patients straight away for bone mineral density. So we do have an option of putting no bone mineral density available yet, but we should put all the other risk factors in. And the software or the website gives us two numbers. One is major osteoporotic fracture risk over the next 10 years and a hip fracture risk over the next 10 years. And that would help us to utilize our flowchart to make a decision on the patient. This is the flowchart again. So in certain situations like here or here, we need to calculate fracture risk and make a decision accordingly. This is the second page of the summary. Basically says all individuals who are over age of 50 and sustain a fracture following minimal trauma. We should assume that they have osteoporosis. And for that reason, depending on which bone is broken, hip uh, or vertebra, as opposed to other bones, sometimes we have to take further action and sometimes by using the bone mineral density and sometimes we know that this patient is going to go on treatment. Uh, what else? So a, a, a presumptive diagnosis of osteoporosis can be made in patients with vertebral fracture or hip fracture, like I said before, and treatment can be started, but the bone mineral density is an extra bonus thing that we do just to have a baseline. And we talked about the 10% risk, and sometimes we uh, need to go by the risk because if the uh, if the risk is less than is less than ten percent, we don't have to go ahead with the DEXA scan. And then after we've done the DEXA scan, if the risk comes back as high enough, like we said, then we need to start treatment. Another new thing in the guidelines is about prevention or or, or prevention of fracture in people who are osteoporotic or at risk of osteoporosis. In the past, the emphasis was just on weight-bearing exercise to improve the bone health and density. Whereas now, they talk about three different areas. One is working on muscle strength, as you have seen also in other guidelines, for example, CKD guidelines, more importantly, cardiovascular guidelines. You don't just talk about aerobic exercise to increase the heart rate. We also talk about muscle strengthening exercises at least twice a week. Weight-bearing exercise with significant impact of at least 50 impacts included in the exercise to uh, increase the bone density and also balance training, which is going to help with the fall prevention. If you're looking at therapy, the guidelines and you know, a bit more explanation of what medications and what conditions can be considered as risk factors for minimal trauma fracture. In the flowchart, the summary, we don't have all of these, but for your exam or for your uh, general knowledge, you may find certain things in here, for example, certain medications, which can cause, uh, which can be considered as a risk factor for minimal trauma fractures. For example, proton pump inhibitors do have some modest effect on fracture risk. Uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs that all our patients are on, they are considered as a risk factor for osteoporosis and for, for example, in particular for minimal trauma fracture and many other things that you can see in this list. So let's talk about some key points from these new guidelines. We talked about the definition of minimal trauma. We talked about the vertebral and hip fracture being uh, enough if they're caused by minimal trauma to treat patients with osteoporotic medications. Remember, use of sunscreen is not going to impact the vitamin D level. So we do recommend sun exposure 
modest sun exposure safely uh, for vitamin D uh, boost in our body. And patients can still use sunscreen without being worried about the impact on vitamin D level. Remember, in general people, in general uh, healthy people, we don't recommend calcium or vitamin D supplement unless the patient is not receiving 1300 milligram of calcium in their diet. So the first emphasis is on improving calcium intake via diet and also improving vitamin D level via sun exposure. In people who are institutionalized, like for example, elderly people in aged care facilities, we know that the chance of receiving enough calcium or vitamin D naturally is low. So generally, it is recommended to consider putting them on supplements for those reasons. And for patients who do have diagnosis of osteoporosis, again, if we are comfortable that they are receiving 1300 milligram of calcium per day from the diet, we don't have to put them on supplements. And we only need to put them on vitamin D supplement if their vitamin D level is less than 50. So we don't have to put everyone, as soon as we diagnose osteoporosis, on these supplements. Obviously, where they live and the amount of sun exposure and the color of skin would impact the vitamin D natural intake as well. So we talked about the general hip and vertebral fracture as a reason to treat. The other thing to look at when you are looking to diagnose people with potentially silent vertebral fracture, which the patient may not complain about and still sitting there, which qualifies the patient for receiving osteoporotic fracture is, for example, loss of more than three centimeters in height. That is a reason to assume this patient may have osteoporotic vertebral fracture. That is a reason to order a lateral thoracolumbar x-ray. And if you find osteoporotic fractures in the lumbar spine or thoracic spine, that is by itself enough reason to put them on treatment. Same as people who have developed kyphosis or they have unexplained back pain in certain age that you would think this may be caused by a silent vertebral osteoporotic fracture. That's a reason to order a, an X-ray. You may do a bone density scan and the bone density may not find the osteoporosis as such, but you know that if you find a one or two osteoporotic vertebral fracture, that would be gold in finding a patient who would benefit from osteoporotic treatment. We talked about FRAX as our fracture cal calculator or fracture risk calculator. Um, and that would help us sometimes to order more BMDs, sometimes to order less BMDs or DEXA scans. We talked about the very high risk people who would require straight referral to specialists, either endocrinologists or rheumatologists. We talked about the T score of less than three and an extra risk factor. And extra risk factors were in your flowchart. Examples were those who are on glucocorticoids or those who have multiple clinical risk factors for uh, fragility fracture. These are all the medications we have around for osteoporosis. The top three are available to us as GPs, uh, bisphosphonates and denosumab and the hormone therapy, estrogen and tibolone. We can consider selective estrogen receptor modulators like laroxifen, but we prefer to leave that decision to specialists. So the top three are the ones in, in the flowchart which are recommended for us to initiate first. And the bottom two are definitely just for specialists. They are osteoanabolic treatments. Let's talk about the bisphosphonates briefly. We have alendronate, recitronate, and zoledronic acid as the injectable one. We don't like to use 
bisphosphonates in people who have active upper gastrointestinal tract disorders, including strictures, Barrett esophagus, or esophageal or duodenal ulcer. There are contraindications. We like people to take them on empty stomach and you know, don't eat anything for at least 30 minutes and remain upright for 30 minutes after taking them. Having said that, we do have access to enteric coated resedronate uh, or actinel, which uh, does allow patients to take it with or without food, which makes it easier for them to take this medication. Other things to remember with bisphosphonates, one of these was an ex a KFP exam question, is taking calcium, iron, uh, or magnesium supplements or antiacids. With the bisphosphonates, you need to allow 60 minutes before bisphosphonates and taking any of these supplements because they would heavily impact the absorption of your bisphosphonate. Like all other osteoporosis medications that we use, we like to make sure that the patient's vitamin D is above 50. This is even more important with injectable bisphosphonates, like the, we only have one, which is the, uh, the uh, zoledronate acid. Uh, we definitely need to make sure the vitamin D is above 50 before we infuse the patient with that. It has to be a slow infusion as well. Uh, that uh, zoledronic acid does have risk of, you know, not risk, but having the potential side effect of flu-like symptoms, which is not something major to worry about. And remember, we are not recommended to mix bisphosphonates with any other osteopor anti-osteoporotic medications that we have, including even hormone therapy. In terms of duration of bisphosphonate therapy, we usually aim for five to 10 years once we stop, once we start them, we like to go for five to 10 years. After five to 10 years, we can recalculate T-score by using a DEXA. If the T-score is above minus 2.5 and no recent fracture, we may consider stopping the treatment. But if the T-score is still below minus 2.5, or there has been incident of fracture, we don't stop just based on timing, we just keep going. Or even if we stopped and the patient developed a new fracture with a minimal trauma fracture, a fragility fracture, that is an indication by itself to restart the bis bisphosphonate treatment again. The second medication we have is our Prolia, which has been available for a couple of decades now, roughly every six monthly injection. It's an option for postmenopausal women at high risk of minimal trauma fracture. It can be considered as an alternative to bisphosphonates for even men with increased risk of minimal trauma fracture. We do not like interruption in treatment. We like the patient to come back every six months and to receive treatment, and they need to be aware that they can just leave the treatment. And if at any point we decide to stop Prolia, we need to replace it with a bisphosphonate for at least 12 months if we want to avoid the vertebral fractures which can happen if we stop the Prolia treatment. Hypocalcemia is another side effect to be aware of with denosumab more than bisphosphonates. We can't use it in, sev uh, in severe renal impairment. And if someone does have severe renal impairment, hypocalcemia becomes even more of a risk. So proper dietary intake of calcium and proper vitamin D level is a must. We do have option of menopausal hormone therapy with estrogen. Uh, we only like to consider this one for women within the first 10 years of menopause. We know after 10 years from menopause, the complications and side effect of menopausal hormone therapy become more significant. So within the first 10 years, there's no other contraindication. You're comfortable to use that as, a, as an option. If we, for whatever reason, we don't want to choose the other options, or if the patient has indications for hormone therapy, for example, some menopausal symptoms that would be an option to strengthen their bones as well. 
Another alternative would be selective estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen and raloxifen. But again, these are the agents that are not first, uh, first line options. And I think we are best to talk to a specialist before we consider tamoxifen or raloxifen for osteoporosis because of the side effect profile. You are aware of the potential risks involved with the menopausal hormone therapy, breast cancer, uh, venous thromboembolism, and cardiovascular effects, which are less within the first 10 years of menopause and become more significant over time. Uh, Tibolone is another option, does help with the vasomotor symptoms of menopause. And if they are considering a treatment for osteoporosis at the same time, then it makes it a good choice. Uh, as an alternative for estrogen replacement. Remember, if anyone is on menopause hormone therapy and they are going through an episode of immobilization for either long plane trip or for hospitalization, it is recommended to stop menopausal hormone therapy or raloxifen for a week before and a week after the immobilization period. And we don't combine raloxifen with menopausal hormone therapy. The specialist options that we have, the two options, they are both injectables. We don't prescribe them, but we may have patients on them uh, initiated by specialists. It's good to know what they are. One is uh, ramozazumab, which is an injectable um, monthly injection. It's a first line therapy for those at very high risk of minimal trauma fracture, the one on the left side of the flow chart. And the other one is teriparatide, which is a, basically a recombinant human parathyroid hormone. And again, for same group of people, a specialist may, may decide to put them on this uh, daily injection and they are stronger in terms of increasing the bone density compared to the other ones that we have available as GPs. Two particular groups of people are at high risk of minimal trauma fracture, and they require close monitoring, and we have lower threshold for putting them on um, anti-osteoporotic medications. One are women who are for breast cancer on aromatase inhibitor therapy. Examples are Arimidex, Femara, or Aromacin that you might be aware of and you've seen patients on them. With the patients, with women with breast cancer on these medications, uh, we like to do a baseline DEXA scan and we like to monitor them uh, for risk factor for osteoporosis. If they are on these medications and they have a risk, an extra risk factor, then they would benefit from starting on anti-resorptive therapy unless it's contraindicated. So if someone is on these medications and they're over age of 70 with a bone density T-score of less than minus two, or if they're over age of 50 and they had minimal trauma fracture, uh, or if they have high estimated risk of a uh, high estimated risk of fracture using a FRAX, then they would benefit from going on tre treatment regardless of the you know, other criteria that we had in our flow chart. In men who are on androgen deprivation therapy for prostate cancer, again, we like to do a BMD assessment as a baseline and fracture risk assessment as baseline, similar to women on aromatase inhibitors. Um, if they have history of minimal trauma fracture, they should be commenced on anti-resorptive therapy, similar to the other group that we had in women. And we need to review them as long as they are on ADT every year or second year and potentially assess the BMD and fracture risk and see if they are uh, eligible for anti-resorptive therapy. One last thing um, before we move on to our therapeutic guidelines section for osteoporosis is what we talk about a lot, 
and that is osteonecrosis of the jaw. This is a complication that can happen with prolia or denosumab, and it can also happen with bisphosphonates. Remember, the risk is generally low, so we talk about this a lot, but we don't need to worry about it as such. Unless the patient has extra risk factors for osteonecrosis, these are the extra risk factors like poor oral hygiene, smoking, being on steroids or angiogenesis inhibitors, or if they have diabetes or anemia, they can increase the risk of developing osteonecrosis. Uh, if the duration of treatment is less than four years with bisphosphonates or, uh, you know, basically this is going to help you to see how, how significant is the risk of osteonecrosis. I think there's a typo in here. It there has to be no additional risk factors. So if the patient is on anti-resorptive therapy for osteoporosis, and the duration of treatment is less than four years, and they don't have any of these extra risk factors, then the risk is low. If the answer to any of these is yes, then the risk is higher, and we need to have a chat with the maxillofacial surgeon or a dentist, or a dentist need to have a chat with the maxillofacial surgeon. One practical point to remember is that if the patient is on prolia and they are going to receive some dental procedures, the best time to plan the procedure is just before the next six monthly injection. So if they're due for injection next month, this month is the best time to receive the dental procedure. A few extra points from therapeutic guidelines about osteoporosis. Again, remember the calcium intake. There are some concerns about extra calcium intake. One is about uh, kidney stones. The other thing is potentially, and this is controversial, but there's potential extra risk with too much calcium intake for coronary artery disease and generally with atherosclerosis. So we don't like the calcium intake to be above 2000 milligram a day. So if someone is receiving a lot of calcium in their diet, we may need to think about putting them on extra calcium supplement because they may exceed the 2,000 milligram a day. And the usual recommendation for vitamin D supplementation is, again, not more than 4,000 international units a day. So if you're going to give calcium supplement, usually 600 milligram is the one available. Uh, and that is probably a good supplement for someone who has average calcium intake. But if someone really has, you're confident that they receive 1300 milligram, they may not require extra calcium. This is a summary of the medications that we use. You have all the bisphosphonates on the screen. We talked about not mixing alendronate or resedronate with um, food or antacid or calcium or magnesium or iron. We said it's, they are not recommended for severe kidney disease. Um, same as the zoledronic acid. Obviously, that doesn't have the uh, problem. The being an injector doesn't have any problem with the food. But again, not recommended for severe kidney disease. And hypocalcemia is a bigger risk with, <clears throat> with Zometa. We talked about the denosumab in detail. So... Um, indefinite treatment is the usual plan, or as we've learned from the new guidelines, at least one year of bisphosphonates at the end, if you decide to come after prolia. And the reason is multiple spontaneous vertebral fracture that can happen once the patient has uh, been withdrawn from prolia. And hypocalcemia is again another risk similar to uh, zoledronic acid with denosumab as well. With further discussion from therapeutic guidelines on bisphosphonates, we talked about vitamin D being over 50, EGFR of 35, particularly this applies to the injectable one, the Zometa, good calcium range, good hydration before you give the intravenous infusion of zoledronic acid in general practice. <clears throat> 
what you see on this slide about the Tenaz map is not much more than what we've already discussed. So this is just a repetition of what we've learned already. And again, we need good calcium level, good vitamin D level before we give Prolia injection every six months. And in terms of hormone replacement therapy, anything with estrogen would be useful. These are just some examples. And within 10 years from menopause is the safe window after 10 years. Uh, I think based on what I've read, you'd like to have some specialist input if you want to continue or if you want to initiate hormone replacement therapy. Yeah.